So by that short introduction, I want to warmly welcome you on stage, Henning, and we will listen to your presentation and there will be a Q&A session afterwards. So please join me all in when coming Henning on, on the stage. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me to the virtual stage. It would be much nicer to be there, all of you physically, but it saves travel, I suppose. So what I want to do the time I had this morning is to reflect a little bit uh, on a moment in networking technology history that we don't quite recognize because we've been so used to a world that we, come on, we almost all of us, at least, if not grew up in, at least have just gotten used to it, namely that we had safely two worlds, namely the carrier world, largely dominated by a large, uh, by a very small number of very large equipment vendors like Ericsson and Huawei and Nokia and so on, and an enterprise world that, mind to some extent, I suspect has been the focus of LCN in the past, largely dominated by. Uh, unlicensed spectrum. And what the point I will be trying to make is that we are at a decision point that had occurred earlier for other technologies in the sense that uh, technologies that we see as separate, uh, such as my kind of home computing and enterprise computing or carrier voice services and enterprise voice services, are largely converging and have converged. So now we are facing a push to a single unitary networking standard uh, in particular. And what I wanna point out that is that we should be careful what we wish for. Um, and I'll go through that in more detail. So we can think of networking in, in a way as a biological system, uh, just like come on, in, in a ecosystem, the ecological niches where different animals and plants emerge that are particularly well adapted to that, even though I mean, they share in some sense basic building blocks of biology, but they put them together and make different trade-offs in each case. So that you have, I mean, you have different species uh, coexisting uh, for millions of years simply because they're good at different things. And so in networking technology, um, we've basically had kind of four attempts, some more successful than others, that have at least persisted for a decade plus. Namely, we had I, IoT type of standards, let's say Zigbee being a, an example of that, uh, that are primarily optimized for low energy consumption. Uh, they don't have any grand ambitions to connect your laptop or to provide mobile services and that. Uh, then we've had Bluetooth, uh, obviously initially as essentially a, uh, a set of uh, technologies for headphones, really, uh, where they were first successful. And primarily, I think they were successful not because Bluetooth technology is so great, actually in many ways it is not, but because it comes with a set of profiles for mice and keyboard and headphones and, uh, and other peripherals that make it relatively likely that once you can actually pair that darn new headset with your uh, laptop or your smartphone, it will actually work. It will, it will, sound will come out of it. And your mouse, your Bluetooth mouse will work with a Mac and a PC without installing drivers. Uh, and so that really is because it offers a vertically integrated system uh, all the way if you'd like to the application layer I mean, or, whatever it happens to be. And then we've had obviously Wi-Fi, I primarily used for, wi for offload uh, and for in-home connectivity uh, for reasons that I'll go into. And then clearly we had uh, a very cellular technology with an emphasis initially on interoperable voice. So again, an integrated service, you could assume if you bought a smartphone, you could call people with it and mobility and the ability to roam internationally uh, in many cases, although it actually doesn't always work out so well. 
But with the discussion about 5G, one of the differences I don't think is emphasized enough is a lot of discussion about millimeter waves and uh, new uh, network uh, architectures to some extent and low latency and so on. But the ambition is actually much grander than that. Namely, the notion is that 5G and its successors would essentially be the one network that binds them all and that you don't really need any of these other networks that I just describe as having ecological niches. You just have variations of the same networking standard in it. Now, and I'm not talking about this here, we've clearly had a version of that in the sense that when Ethernet on the wired side largely has displaced other a similar my local area and metropolitan area networks. Uh, so this is not unheard of, even outside the new wireless realm. So we are clearly now seeing two movements of, a service, of network technologies, namely this is the standard Gardner high curve from a year ago, uh, namely for 5G services kind of reaching peak hype cycle and then Wi-Fi 6, uh, moving towards a more maybe realistic assessment as well, although I don't think we've ever received the level of um, popular attention all the way up to the highest political levels that 5G has. Now, when we talk about 5G, it's, I think, interesting to note, and I've made this point before, that when we think of what 5G was supposed to do and what it might do, we have to look at what other generations actually did in the sense of generations of uh, technology. So just we can start, if, if you want to call it that, that's my nomenclature, zero G, namely landline. I mean, it was designed as a voice network, but it actually became the enabler of the internet and of data communication by fax and modems. I, 1G kind of analog cellular became kind of a corporate limousine, by, it was meant as a corporate limousine box that you had uh, if you were a, a sufficient uh, corporate salary level. I, and the surprise that occurred was that people actually started eavesdropping on your calls. Again, for 2G, the emphasis was on digital voice, better voice quality than the analog uh, that you had previously. But the killer app was simple, short text messages that emerged. 3G, the big thing was wireless access to kind of some simplified version of the web. Well, what happened was the initial beginnings through the iPhone in particular of some version of web and app access to the internet. And then for 4G, it was multimedia services, video conferencing on your smartphone. I find that didn't quite happen on smartphones in that model, but what we got was YouTube and WhatsApp and notifications and Facebook on mobile and so on. And then for 5G, clearly the promise has been, I mean, largely the new market has been low latency, uh, largely connecting devices like robots and haptics and so on uh, to that. And we don't quite know yet what the supplies will be uh, in that. I suspect it will actually be fixed wireless. Uh, that will be kind of one of the surprise use cases of that that wasn't really anticipated in that. What we haven't talked about that I believe that really what drove adoption from a carrier and user perspective was reduction in cost per gigabyte. And I mean, this is very rough. Don't take the numbers too seriously. Just they have to look around. Uh, so that I'd argue that each innovation roughly divided the cost per gigabyte by about a factor of 10. Uh, you know. And so that any next generation, and there's clearly a lot of discussion about 6G already, is that really will the primary motivator will likely be can it further reduce the cost of providing a gigabit of data, uh, not will it provide any fancy new services. The other observation, again, hardly original, is that uh, there is a reason that if you look at mass adoption, that generally speaking, the even ones seem to be the ones that really make a large scale difference, as in 2G really broad mobile telephony to the masses, 
uh, not just to kind of a top 1%. 4G really made internet on a mobile device feasible. And you know, there's discussion now that 6G will essentially do what 5G might have promised. So one thing to point out is that if we look at kind of a typical promises or typical descriptions of the cellular generations, they tend to focus almost exclusively on physical layer characteristics, speed, latency, and devices uh, in that. As I will try to point out, I think that will increasingly become irrelevant. Now, 5G also, besides kind of being a natural technical evolution, fulfilled a key need in, in kind of the overall eco ecosystem. So man, depending on where you start, the carriers had kind of milked their 4G. Nobody found that particularly attractive anymore. So particularly the premium carriers of Verizon in the United States in particular, they needed to show that it was worthwhile paying more for their network than for their low cost competitor networks. So what better to do than next generation? It worked pretty well for 3G and 4G. And plus, they needed a mechanism to convince the regulator and political authority that they needed both spectrum and regulatory relief. So the best argument to make, uh, if you needed something from a regulator or from your local parliament was to say, well, there's this magic of 5G coming along. If you don't do that, you're gonna be, mind you are hindering um, our ability to provide 5G will be falling behind, say, China uh, on technology. We won't have self driving cars and humming factories and what have you. So give us more spectrum and uh, give us relief from uh, what we consider burdensome regulatory um, rules. Uh, you know. So, from a carrier perspective, this is there is a reason that they needed a new generation. I mean, it labeled of a new generation, even though I mean, for those of us following the GPP evolution, it is really a somewhat arbitrary delineation between two releases of a technical standard, unlike say, I mean, like when you look the transition between 1G and 2G, where it was a complete swap out of a technology. So if I may, Equipment manufacturer perspective, clearly everybody had bought whatever 4G gear they already needed. So clearly you needed something new. You can't just keep selling the old stuff, particularly because mine, I, then lower cost vendors will essentially commoditize it and turn it into stuff that you buy at a discount um, because it's no longer leading edge technology. Government saw it as, well, this is a relatively cheap compared to things like education or infrastructure. It's a relatively cheap way to seem like a hip thing to do. Uh, so the promise is if we only add 5G, that will solve our competitiveness problems, uh, that will solve our e-government problems, that will solve our health problems. We'll, just add my, a relatively modest amount of money and maybe we'll even get some spectrum auction money along the way. And then from a my, journalist perspective, once you get tired of writing about the latest privacy breach or uh, the latest shenanigans taking place on social networks, well, maybe you need a positive tech story that when particularly some of the magazines that kind of thrive on those and 5G is kind of the back to the good old days when you could get excited about a new release of an Intel CPU. Uh, so you have something to write about. So, and researchers, I don't think are quite innocent. We also need new topics. Plus, particularly those uh, researchers working on quality of service, we got two new things to work with, slices and ultra-reliable communication. So we can do another spin of the QoS uh, research paper. Unfortunately, the economic case for 5G looks a bit weaker. I, generally speaking, and that's a good thing for consumers, the average revenue per user for all the US carriers, and this is true internationally as well, has decreased dramatically uh, in that. So they've gone down to roughly half within the last, this is from 2017, so it's a little dated, but it hasn't really abated. 
uh, data usage has gone up, but I, the willingness of people to pay for their service has not. So this is a hope to add new revenue to a market that doesn't look so great from a carrier perspective. And then you had this notion of the internet of things where you could say, well, we need for some reason for IOT one millisecond type latency. And so I, this is gonna be the great enabler for IOT, which again, gets back to the competitiveness angle of factory 4.0 and all of that. You know. So I, the, what was happening is you had actually this notion that was embedded in the public perception that you needed in order to have really large scale IoT, you needed 5G. The reality turned out to be, I think, a much more mundane in the sense that much of what now passes for IoT runs on Wi-Fi and Zigbee to some limited and diminishing extent, uh, and on LoRa maybe, um, on the wider area, and on 2G in many cases, because most of the stuff is really boring, uh, one bit an hour type of uh, devices that don't really need a bat, but it made for a good story. And it, as a side of note is the notion of IoT is about as old as the hills. It dates back really for some of us who are old enough to remember that, that when this is from 1978, uh, the X10 power line communication system uh, that provide, wasn't called IoT, it was called home automation at that point. And indeed, but even the term IoT was coined in 1985 before the web existed. The other one that came out was, uh, I think the carriers and justifiably saw, so, saw their computing uh, demands moving to the clouds, as in uh, they no longer central, all the interesting computing stuff was taking place by the big uh, hyperscale cloud providers. So they said, okay, we can provide computing. We can sell computing too via edge computing uh, in that. I, I won't go through that in detail. It's a little bit peripheral to, I think, the discussion. Um, let's just say that's not quite playing out the way that was anticipated. Edge computing clearly exists. I, all the major cloud providers are doing it. It just turns out the carriers are not really, they're mostly just reselling it and the applications tend to be somewhat niche simply because the saving and latency that you get is usually so small for most applications, you're talking 10, 20 milliseconds, that the cost differential right, better not be too large uh, to do that. Plus, you usually need access to uh, background, background databases that are hard to distribute for most interesting applications. And so I, I have my personal doubts whether this will be used for anything except some relatively niche, important, but niche applications. But that's a separate discussion. So one of the things, and now we're getting to the kind of the core point of it is that because of its evolution in as a carrier technology, with an emphasis on very large, uh, very, I, my legacy adult systems, uh, the networks that you had in uh, carriers tended to be extremely complex. So this is a shows the kind of a standards 29 for those of you who haven't seen that 29.212 for example just to take one is just one of many uh, 3GPP standards in that that I uh, standardize things on top of the existing IP protocol. So this is not even defining the IP protocols largely it is largely defining how to use those for, uh, let's say in this case, a 4G uh, network. So we had these extremely complex networks often driven by billing needs uh, at the forefront. I mean, after all, these are all kind of pay by the minute or pay by the gigabyte type of networks uh, at their core uh, in that. And I buy the notion to interoperate with legacy systems, both legacy earlier generations, as well as legacy voice type of systems. And indeed, so this is an example of a, of a voice system is that you had all these complex 
a boxes with each of their interfaces specified with the notion that each one of us would be modeled as a box in a 19 inch rack sitting somewhere in a corporate, in a carrier data center. And indeed, uh, if you look at the 5G architecture, which besides kind of a millimeter wave and some of the other um, uh, physical layer advancements has also re-engineered and uh, to some extent simplified. The um, kind of packet core is that you have a, a, a pretty complex ecosystem uh, that is really meant for very large multi-million customer type of systems, professionally managed by my experts in that particular one or outsourced to companies like Ericsson. Um, and they do this because it makes sense in that particular environment. But that's, so even a network with a handful of users needs all of that complexity to work because that's what you need for or what you, people believe you need. One can argue about that um, for a large network. The other thing that has been changing is that in kind of the first through fourth generation, you had basically a single network operator being a vertically integrated entity. So they, uh, they owned, installed, and operated everything from towers to fibers to the SIMs and to software on the phone uh, and to selling stuff in stores. Now, they didn't produce all of that, obviously. They didn't, they didn't make the fiber or uh, make the radios, but they would intimately involve in each of these aspects. And they are certainly owning those as kind of, it was their network, their tower, their store, uh, and handsets that they branded uh, in that. Uh, so they were certainly the system integrator and operator for all of those components. That is fundamentally changing. We don't appreciate that, think that as much, but what's been changing is that many of the carriers now are essentially a marketing front to services largely provided by others. Towers are largely, at least in the US, not owned by carriers anymore. They are owned, generally speaking, by two large real estate companies, American Tower and Crown Castle. The backbone networks are owned by CenturyLink, uh, previously level three, Cogent and so on, or uh, you have fiber networks that are owned uh, by other companies. Equipment is largely now generic uh, in that, uh, and uh, management is often outsourced to third parties too. So a carrier in a modern environment is really largely a kind of, when I make that analogy, like an airline that buys equipment, um, leases the equipment in many cases, doesn't actually own it, and puts its corporate logo on it, uh, prints the napkins and the uniforms for the flight attendants, but I mean, it's actually operated by a host of different companies just to provide a uniform customer experience, but it's not really operated by uh, the airlines in that particular case, and certainly not, the technology is not developed by the company anymore. I mean, we all know how little research most of the carriers do these days. So one of the things that I don't think I mean, the marketing has really uh, emphasized is that the realistic hope, I think most of the carriers have realized that charging people more for 5G doesn't really work. A number of carriers have tried, or at least in the US, they all seem to have given up on that particular notion to some large extent. People are just unwilling to pay more for a 5G a mobile network service than for a 4G one. Uh, that may change in certain circumstances. I think there's a very limited ability to do that, particularly because 5G is and will likely be available at higher speeds, not just at some different phi technology in only the smallest area. So the map that it's on the right shows a, a Verizon map, coverage, uh, coverage map for Verizon in downtown Denver. 
So this is the core downtown, and you can see, man, there's some purple areas there, but even in the downtown core, it is largely not available. So what some of the carriers, uh, in the US two carriers primarily, Verizon and T-Mobile have been doing, is they have been saying, we can leverage our fancy mobile network for fixed wireless access, because we can now, do that cheaper than running fiber to a building. It is much, uh, the install time is much lower. You don't have to have a day spent with a technician running physical fiber into a building, but, or in, in, into the basement, you can just do that, just install a self-install antenna uh, on that at reasonable speeds. Uh, and then the other one is that you have uh, networks that used to be covered or still are to some extent by network oper aggregators or operators like Boingo that would be in airports and stadiums and convention centers, all the places that we don't go these days. Um, and because the user base has largely become mobile. Um, it's no longer people sitting with laptops and in the airport lounges, it's people sitting right there with their smartphone uh, in that. And you can integrate those either with a mobile network operation or even for private network with some eSIM type of model. And then the big promise, factory networks, uh, namely the notion that instead of running either a kind of proprietary wi uh, wireless network for factory control or a um, network that's used for, a, for like a Wi-Fi style network or wired network, even that type of or similar field bus type of network is that you could run factory networks on uh, 5G technology, private networks. The carriers clearly hope that they will be operating those networks. That seems unlikely at this point. We don't seem to have any particular expertise in running factory networks. We just don't have access to my industrial engineers any morning a consulting company or a General Electric or a, a ABB or any of the other uh, kind of Siemens or any of these other companies that actually build the equipment that they run in the factory has uh, in that. So one advantage, and I, again, I think this deserves more attention, that makes that at least somewhat plausible at the moment is the emergence of semi-licensed spectrum for a uh, a 5G uh, in particular, not 4G as well, but for 4 and 5G, namely in the US for CBRS, for Citizen Band Radio Service. Uh, in, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. So CBRS is actually an interesting model that you could see as kind of this emerging hybridization of uh, networks that used to be kind of easily uh, distinguishable. We had the world when, I mean, when we teach a networking course, we probably teach our students say, well, there is unlicensed spectrum and there's licensed spectrum. We mostly talk in classes and textbooks about the unlicensed part. I mean, most textbooks really, networking textbooks don't really cover cell or network in any great depth, unless you take a special comms course. I, but now, at least in the US, and I think this will be emerging elsewhere too, because it's just sufficiently attractive is that a really nice chunk of spectrum, uh, so kind of nice mid-band spectrum, so not millimeter waves, so it goes through walls and not, I mean, with sufficient capacity, so roughly 150 megahertz type of spectrum is available uh, for that. And so in the US you have is a pre-tiered system that emerged, namely the incumbents, uh, primarily uh, naval radar at the coasts and the Great Lakes. Uh, some uh, wireless internet service providers that had licenses spectrum and some satellite users, fixed uh, stations, satellite stations uh, have priority access, but that covers only a small fraction of uh, the real estate in the US. And then you have a mixture of licensed and unlicensed spectrum. So you have, you can get for relatively modest amounts for relatively small areas, a county in the US, or so one of 3,000 or so subdivisions in the US, you can get a license. So in rural areas, that's relatively cheap. 
uh, you know, in urban areas, not so much. And, but there's also then at least 50 megahertz of GA, general authorized access, which is just a spectrum managed, uh, database spectrum management, spectrum database managed uh, slice of spectrum that is far less noisy than traditional Wi-Fi bands. Um, and because, uh, allows higher power in those Wi-Fi bands. So they've become quite attractive to essentially extend ethernets out uh, several miles. So initial experiments seem to indicate and uh, you can get about two to six miles from a, a classical cell tower uh, with a reasonable height uh, custom antenna. So roof size, roof uh, height custom antenna, uh, you can reach particularly rural areas through that spectrum management system. So currently that's as best as I can tell only available for LTE and 5G, um, but in principle, the technology says nothing about that it couldn't be running under kind of a Wi-Fi framework too. If there's a, in the US, a, the licenses are, they specify like out of band emissions and power levels, they don't specify the modulation or a, the precise packet format, for example, or the technology. In general, I, we think of the cellular system and ecosystem and the Wi-Fi ecosystem as being on largely parallel track, kind of the enterprise carrier division. That really hasn't been the case for years in the sense that we've had this, well, naturally when there are available technologies at the physical layer, they very rapidly percolate to both the Wi-Fi and the LTE ecosystem, uh, and 3G and before that. So we've had this parallel evolution of the two uh, technologies where generally speaking, one can argue that realistic speeds of, the, of Wi-Fi systems tend to be about 10 times faster than uh, cellular speeds. That has been true for at least 20 years. Um, but otherwise, there's a lot of similarity for obvious reasons. So what might be kind of, what might be the next 10 years? So my notion is that it will largely be a, a maintenance of the status quo. I do not see, to summarize kind of what I'll be talking about a little bit more, I do not see this as kind of 5G or 6G, whenever that comes along, and not as dominating, simply because of the inherent attractiveness of leveraging fiber data prices, which are very close to zero uh, at this point on an incremental basis, uh, for through Wi-Fi, which the cellular ecosystem has never managed. For a variety of just business purpose reasons. So if you look at kind of for, for example, of the um, IoT systems, just to take that to get global roaming uh, without, you still end up paying about $330 per gigabyte to do that. Now you wouldn't do that for anything that uses gigabytes, but it shows that if you have a security camera, why would you ever connect it through that expensive technology if there is Wi-Fi available locally where you most likely won't have any incremental cost whatsoever. Indeed, the technologies across the two uh, kind of uh, parallel universes look not all that different. They all use MIMO, multi-user MIMO at this point. They all use OFDMA. Uh, the bands are starting to overlap, like the 3.5, I suspect will sooner or later also be part of the uh, Wi-Fi ecosystem. Uh, 60 gigahertz is already part of a different Wi-Fi-like standards. So they share the same frequency bands. Distinction between license and unlicensed is becoming increasingly dubious uh, in that. So the differences, and once we don't talk about as technologists as much, is really primarily the business model and what it takes to operate those networks, namely generally that my, most of us can install a Wi-Fi network just fine. I mean, these days you can just, you can set up a mesh network by just 
plugging in into Power Outlet and going through some setup screen and in some app. I, I don't think I would not be qualified to set up a cellular network. I would fail miserably at that without taking my I mean, year technician training I by one of the vendors, just to take one example, even though they do the same thing. So and there's an interesting article, which I'll have some problems with in some details, but I like the division that they made uh, that was appeared just uh, less than a month ago in, on archive. Uh, that a better way of thinking about networks as opposed to the newest modulation technique is to look at these two axes, namely ownership and spectrum usage. Uh, and that, namely, and that gives us these kind of nine roughly combinations that you could have in that that we need to accommodate in networks and that have a profound influence on how the network is architected and optimized. So when we look ahead, we will, I think, continue to see quite different ecological niche optimization. So we'll continue to have fixed function peripherals. Uh, we will continue to have applications where bandwidth cost, like in a residential setting, is the dominant one. And we'll have some high bandwidth, both outdoor and indoor type of ones like lecture halls and so on, uh, which again have their own optimization criteria. So as networks and engineering networks, we should think of those applications, again, as opposed to the notion that there is just one type of network. Each of these use cases has a very different optimization uh, criteria and trade-offs inherently. And not surprisingly, you tend to arrive with in different solutions. So what we should look at, I believe, from a network property are not just speed and latency, which I think becoming increasingly relevant, but really kind of other properties, namely universality. Can I operate the system anywhere in the world? That's particularly important for consumer devices and IoT devices. Uh, it's not terribly useful if you have to ship a separate a model IoT device for each country in Europe or each country, I mean, each continent even. And you, we expect once we are safe to travel again, uh, well, we expect not to pick up a new SIM or let alone a new cell phone at the airport when we want to maintain connectivity. Our laptop generally works in, in hotels, regardless of whether I mean, that's a, a SAS hotel in Scandinavia or a, I mean, a Hilton in the US. Incremental, so uh, and incremental system and data cost, I, in particular, can I build free data system? I, if I'm like a cafe or restaurant or university or whatever, can I build my own network? Can I manage my own users? Uh, as opposed to relying on a carrier to do that? And can I, the system largely manage itself? Those, I believe, are far more important architectural uh, issues than whether a network is a little faster or whatever. So we talk in networking a lot about scaling up networks. Does it scale is kind of a standard question that I suspect gets asked at many a presentation. I'd argue that scaling down is actually harder than scaling up. With enough effort, we've shown that you can scale up just about anything. Throw CPU at it, throw complexity at it, throw engineers at it, you can scale up. It may cost you, but you can scale, it's possible. There's really not been a network that if you don't want, I mean, that if you put enough effort in it, you couldn't scale. What is really hard is scaling down. Can you actually make this work from a home environment all the way to a large enterprise or carrier? Also, and just scaling down as a kind of a side note is important when the overall network, which are generally larger geographic areas, are no longer available. So just as an illustration that we would never have been able to do in a cellular type of environment, is that we were part of a DAPA project that dealt with a, uh, a system for 
I mean, recovering after a devastating cyber attack on the electric utilities uh, in that. And so we, it's called the Radix Project, if you want to look it up. Uh, in that. So we had a separate island, you see it on the map off of Long Island, Plum Island in the upper right hand corner that was had a, uh, a real grid, but not used by real people. Uh, this island is used to research infectious diseases for um, animals. Um, and so you can't get there normally uh, for good, very good reasons. You have to take a ferry uh, and you have to be um, accompanied by um, staff there. And so they, we set up a network with a bunch of other people that essentially we created a utility communication network literally in a box, uh, including the services that go along with that. And again, the idea was that a utility worker, not a trained network engineer, should be able to set that up, including things like a voice service that runs uh, in a fully distributed fashion across that network. So let's look back at what has made Wi-Fi, if we look at ahead to like next generation wireless technology, what has actually been successful? What have been the ecological adaptations that have really helped? Namely, one is that it has had scalable complexity. You can still run 8.11b on 2.4 gigabits uh, today. It works slow, but it works all the way to kind of Wi-Fi 6. It had from the very beginning, sometimes designed, sometimes kind of crafted on by others, architectural flexibility. Uh, you could run a peer-to-peer -peer network, you could run an access point, you could run a mesh, you could run long haul, uh, and you could reuse local wired networks for shared um, cheap data access. And importantly, while the cellular network largely had the SIM model, I fire since 2G really, is that Air 11 has had multiple authentication models. I'll talk about that in more detail, uh, but it basically had anything from just open access, no password required whatsoever, to a comp more complicated radius type database uh, in that. And the minimal viable network uh, functionality that you had to support, uh, just the core of it was relatively simple. Um, my Wi-Fi standards is hardly small, but from a user interface perspective, from a kind of system interface perspective, it looked like an extended ethernet plus IP with a local multicast capability, which made it again, look like a standard LAN, wired LAN. So from a plug it functionality, it was the system model, as in what you had to know about it as a system integrator was extremely limited. And it had from the very beginning international usability because of a shared 2.4 gigahertz band, like kind of a, a happy accident uh, that my microwaves had been in that band before. And so you could take your laptop and make it work pretty much across the world. But other things I think with hindsight haven't worked out so well. Uh, we all know that when Wi-Fi has had a share of security problems, particularly on authentication, but in other parts as well. Uh, the more complex authentication systems, 802.1x, they don't seem to be used all that much. Uh, they use to some extent, but they seem to be kind of finicky. Uh, it's hard to understand often uh, for some of these, like the home versions, as to what confidentiality you get because of a shared keys versus what access authorization you have. So I don't think that has been a great success, both in terms of complexity as well as in terms of actual security. I think we, get, we think we have more security when we log in with a password into uh, a system like that uh, than we actually get. Uh, the captive portal model that we're all familiar with from airports and so on, I think just doesn't work very well for, on, on smartphones. I think there's been a user interface disaster um, and the unlicensed only model I think has uh, proven, has shown its limit, but where, that's why I think some of these hybrid models are really attractive. And when things go wrong, it's still really hard to figure out why this happened. 
As another kind of side, and I don't want to spend too much time on that, is I would argue that Zigbee and Bluetooth both had much larger ambitions, but for a variety of reasons have not lived up to it. In particular, Zigbee seems to be, I would say, on the fading side, simply because they did the classical QoS fallacy, namely uh, just because a particular somewhat more complex standard can't be supported on hardware today, it won't be able to be supported tomorrow. And that just turned out to be wrong. I'm, I'm, adding 8 to 11 functionalities as cheap now as at least as it is to add Zigbee functionality and the power advantage isn't that large given that most devices are not battery operated unless you headphones uh, so now theoretically um, we can indeed replace all of the wi-fi technology and bluetooth and Zigbee and so on with technologies in the cell alone right? This is, it covers pretty much the whole design spectrum. If only your consideration is range and throughput, uh, kind of this combination of the two. But as I said, this is hardly the only design criterion. So is there a world where you would have both Wi-Fi and whatever 6G cell in combination? I, sure, that was likely to happen, but we pay a price for that. For IoT devices, not really feasible. Having both a Wi-Fi and a Zigbee and a cellular interface doesn't seem all that attractive from a cost perspective. Roaming is not seamless. You most likely still have to maintain multiple user identities. Uh, and not, you have to still log into your Wi-Fi and you have to have a SIM or an eSIM. I, it's hard to do traffic control. I, if you have a cellular device that you can connect to, if you had a cellular device on your laptop, if you don't configure it right, suddenly you bypass the corporate firewall. Uh, you know, so that has its own set of problems. Um, IPv6 support can be inconsistent. So switching between the two might be hard uh, to do that seamlessly. And obviously you have more limited competition. One thing that doesn't get emphasized enough is how big the difference is in terms of system cost for adding uh, Wi-Fi, wi Bluetooth, and LoRa. And that. so these are just standard Arduino and other type of additions where generally, for example, a, a LoRa type fan costs you $30 or so, while a cellular modem uh, costs you anywhere from at least $70 to $100, so at least twice that much. One thing I'd argue about while I'm wrapping up here is that what hasn't received enough attention, particularly in cellular networks, is the need for a whole range of authentication models. So that that is the user interface in some sense of the network. And this still doesn't work all that well. I mean, Wi-Fi has the flexibility that I mentioned, when you have your edu eduroam, which is essentially kind of similar to cellular network model, roaming cellular model. Uh, you have uh, the, mind, the picket fence security where you, you scan the password. If you're in the building, you can see it type of thing. Uh, so that kind of works, but it's not really all that great. What has changed is that we have now the ability to actually move from a kind of a web login model, which is my home router, kind of dated by now, to an app-based model uh, on the phone. We're not using that all that well. So we've tried, I mean, WPS, I have yet to meet anybody who's ever successfully used it. It usually isn't available on one or the other side, or you have no idea how to find that button uh, on that router hidden somewhere. So I don't think that particular user simplification attempt was all that successful. So what I'm arguing for is that we should fundamentally rethink I, as to how we should integrate new devices into the network. And here I'm showing some examples based on some research that we have done is namely the model should be one where I explicitly admit devices as opposed to trying to get passwords into devices that don't have keyboards and displays. Let me finish up here. Uh, so in general, there has been a lot of interest in next generation internet, next generation protocols like named data networking and so on. 
in my view, that actually misses fundamentally where the complexity and functionality of networks is, namely in the control layer. Uh, we should spend a lot more time and effort on simplifying the control as opposed to twiddling with IPv8 and, IP, and some of the other new efforts that are coming along uh, as next generation IP uh, that are controversial. So can we think of an integrated architecture that allows us, assuming IPv6 everywhere, that we would have a simplified control layer that unifies the different phi and lower layers into a single system. I believe there's an opportunity there to do that that avoids many of the trade-offs that I mentioned earlier. There's really no reason why you couldn't treat the, why you shouldn't be able in a well-engineered network treat the phi as a separate thing. After all, we learn about layering and uh, separation of concerns and all of that, we're just not very good at actually doing it. It's much harder than it should be to disentangle the different uh, protocol layers and boxes, particularly in the cell and network, but to some extent Wi-Fi as well. This is a longer discussion that I won't have time for, but generally in the sense that I believe that protocols are important, but what matters is now can I actually program the network? Uh, so many of the things that we now, where we can actually deploy new services are based on making it easy for users to program uh, those particular one. And there have been plenty of failures in that, such as SOAP, for example, that then were, got replaced by much simpler protocols uh, that were much more successful to create new services. Let me conclude. So when we look ahead to 6G, I think we should go move far beyond just new phi and new uh, speed or latency requirements. We should think of an architectural we think uh, as kind of the opportunity that we mostly missed in 5G. Uh, it's an opportunity to think, think broadly about uh, networks that scale down, not just scale up networks that have a variety of user integration mechanisms and a variety of management mechanisms that are suitable for very small networks and can be scaled up if necessary. Again, I believe that's actually easier than the scaling down part. We should think of a new control plane that takes these myriad of different protocols that are largely operating independently with their own encoding and security and all of that and see if there isn't a more unified design that makes that possible to think of control as something that's not just routing and management and, and uh, telemetry and tele, uh, te uh, and other management function authentication, but these are really just facets of the same basic control functionality that should share as much as possible of the infrastructure. Separating access from the backbone, I so that you can operate a small cellular network, if technology network locally without having to also operate a wide area network seems like a real opportunity uh, in that. Since I believe likely despite what 5G proponents and 6G most likely will claim, I, until we have this much simpler uh, cellular-like network, I, we will continue to have eco, uh, ecological niches. So I think from a research perspective, there is an opportunity to really bridge the chasm between the two, but we need to think architecturally, not about the physical layer. And with that, thank you, and I'd gladly take any questions. Thanks a lot, Henning, for this insightful and very forward-looking keynote. I'll open up the floor for questions, either orally or people can write in the chat as well. So let's see who has the first question. People do not need to be shy. Mm, let's see if someone is writing. No.
I can talk a little bit, Henning. Um, you work both in with standards and uh, the regulatory body. You worked with FCC before and also a link to the political level with the Senate. Um, how would you say the situation? I was a bit special with the <laughs> president's election, but if we take that question aside, what would you say how doing this going forward, what is the landscape discussing with your former colleagues at FCC and the standards bodies and perhaps some politicians also? Is it a good landscape to do with things or how would you say about that? It's both good and bad. Oh. I'll start with the good part. I, when I was working as a Senate staffer, uh, mostly, I mean, since March remotely, you didn't have to convince anybody anymore. Even when uh, my Senate boss, Senator Wyden, uh, has, has a long, he's not a technologist, but he has had a long affinity to technology, primarily in cybersecurity realm, but also beyond that. But you just didn't have to convince anybody of the value of deploying networks. Uh, and importantly, not just in rural areas, but also making it accessible to low income households, which is a big problem in the United States. I mean, where uh, the unavailability is as many things are driven as much and more by income than it is by technology. Uh, the bad part is that uh, technology standards have kind of gotten enmeshed in, and I alluded to this in this IP, uh, next generation IP discussion, have become politicized. Uh, they've become part of a great power rivalry, uh, concerns about uh, rivalry between China and the rest of the world primarily in that. So that I think makes forward progress challenging. I um, and I, I so I believe that the appreciation for the kind of research and long term work that you need to do um, is still not quite there. I mean, there's still a lot of emphasis on kind of industrial policy as opposed to the more foundational uh, research and open ecosystems that you have. I do see that there's an opportunity, and this is again something that you would never have expected, say, in Congress. People would actually introduce builds on ORAN, on open uh, radio access networks. Again, I mean, at a level of sophistication, when these were not bad efforts, uh, if I may, when they got the basics, in my view, right, uh, that you actually have uh, my technology sophistication much larger than it used to be. You know, I do have some hope that there will be a, uh, a less politicized discussion in the next administration uh, on that, on both of those topics. And as I said, particularly an appreciation of the willingness to, uh, to support uh, network availability, and not just to rural areas, but also to low income households. Now that we know that it's hard to go to school if you don't have uh, home internet access and at least 15 million children in the US don't have that and they can't, but they have to kind of either not they drop out of school effectively or they have to, uh, I mean, they get mailed USB sticks literally uh, to get their lesson plans. So I, I think that's an, there's an opportunity there. Good. Let me see if someone is waving. Yufan. Go ahead. Hey, hi, uh, hi, Henning. So uh, I have a question regarding something like the FCC is trying to reallocate the safety band for Wi-Fi. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you are you aware of that? Right, like the, there's a, yeah, they're they're planning to change this five dot G gigahertz to reallocate to Wi-Fi, and then I yep. think voting will be tomorrow's meeting. And I was wondering what is your thinking on that, is it necessary? Are you in favor of that? So, I mean, the question, is, I mean, there's a whole nother talk that one could give, but is, I would argue that a vehicular networks, and which is, I mean, I think part of that band, what makes a band so contentious, is, has been one of the great policy and technology failures uh, in the past two decades. Um, and again, largely because 
it was conceived as a completely separate network that's now changing with the C2X type of uh, efforts and that, but again, that has its own set of issues um, in that, as opposed to seeing it integrated into my, the capabilities that we had. So I argue that from a best use case perspective, having the notion that you dedicate spectrum to one application is just no longer defensible. Uh, it just, that model went out the window everywhere else. Uh, at least a decade ago, all the regulators, I think, recognized that with very few limitations like passive sensing for radio astronomy, where it's just unavoidable, or some radar applications and GPS and so on, uh, where you have I mean, very high value, uh, like monetary or otherwise applications, but in very limited ability technically to share uh, that spectrum everywhere else, uh, application specific spectrum is just a dead end. Uh, simply because, again, and vehicular networks are a great example of that. We collectively are really, really bad about predicting uh, what will be successful and how will it be successful. Uh, so, yeah, I'm in favor of, uh, of essentially getting rid of wherever possible of application specific frequency allocation and really restricting it to the most uh, intractable problem application like I mentioned like GPS and uh, in passive sensing largely that we can and do spectrum management uh, by database or sensing uh, wherever else uh, we can uh, simply because it gives us the flexibility to evolve and we should my neck uh, is a another long discussion we should rethink how we do vehicular networks i believe fundamentally um as well uh, in that so yeah i'm i'm in favor and i'm hoping that that will actually happen under my i, I don't think my they were incumbents i uh, that i uh, automotive industry in particular that don't like it but generally speaking i see that as being less politically comfortable controversial uh, you know did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? We have 15 minutes to next session, so there's no rush. Yeah, maybe one question uh, from my side. So first of all, thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, I was uh, thinking that um, our take on, on 4G and 5G and future generations is mainly as we, that we see it as a data network, whereas uh, the mobile network operators traditionally I think they see themselves as service providers and now that the classical services that they provide like telephony and SMS and th things like that are fading away uh, towards WhatsApp and, 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 and other technologies, they are, they are putting out all these new services like IoT specific services or, or, or vehicle to vehicle communication and, and stuff. Uh, and, and I would uh, love to hear your take on how that is going to influence the, the future development of, of these uh, standards and the implementation. Yep. So, and this is a, I mean, I, I sympathize with the carriers, uh, like you said, they are, I don't necessarily, uh, it's like one of the standard, of one of these tragic things where somebody is good at something, uh, but they don't actually want to be good at that. Uh, namely, somebody is really good in principle at providing nationwide bit pipes, uh, but the last thing the carriers want to do is provide nationwide and global bit pipes. Uh, in, that, in a sense, uh, the world wants carriers to be boring as in you shouldn't have to think about them, they just work. Uh, just like you, most people or many people probably don't know uh, how their electric or gas network works or exactly how, I mean, who maintains rail in their country. Uh, they just want it to work and be upgraded uh, as appropriate. So my general take is that from a, Again, if we step out of a carrier realm, um, that the value added that has happened in networks has been because and this goes to my quick excursion to programmability is where it became possible for lots of 
niche applications, relatively speaking, at least initially, I to leverage the network capabilities without asking the carrier for permission. I, yeah, so I, I would argue that at least from a technology perspective, the idea of having clean, long-lived and easy interfaces should be the way that we judge the network, not whether the carrier can actually provide the service. So I argue, for example, that we would want the ability, and I'm not convinced that slicing is the right approach for that. I believe it doesn't scale. Uh, and this is really doesn't scale up well enough. Uh, it's just hard to imagine to have millions of slices uh, for one slice per user, and it's really the wrong granularity in many cases. Uh, so that you would have a, a, a notion that I have much more control over the network functionality as an end user, an end user application than I would otherwise have. So I, mean, I should be able to, I, and this is something that networks make really difficult, I should be able to manage my own user base uh, and subdivide access without having to go through a SIM provisioning process. I, I should be able to I essentially become my own mini carrier, again, without becoming an MVNO. I, I should be able to I leverage different networks just like I do for kind of a Wi-Fi model without the networks having to do roaming arrangements. That shouldn't be my problem. Uh, so I, I do see opportunities, but I am worried that given the history of the large carriers, that they tend to cater to the largest of their customers, industrial customers in particular, my kind of enterprise customers, because their model, again, doesn't scale down very well. I, my, their model is a high overhead model, a, a high complexity model, so it is feasible to build a network application for a large airline or a, a large a industrial manufacturer, it is much harder and they have no real um, track record of dealing with individual uh, kind of developers, small startups, or you know, they're trying, but in many cases that seems difficult. So I have my doubts that they're naturally suited for that type of work. And I have my fear that they will block many good efforts that could be occurring simply because when they want to maintain that control uh, as opposed to making it easy for people to very quickly develop new services. Just take an example, I man. Uh, can you assign a student project to somebody uh, to set up an IoT network as I mean, in a semester through a carrier? I, yeah, maybe, but it requires a level of effort that my man is far, far outpaces what it takes to buy a LoRa gateway or a Bluetooth gateway or a Zigbee gateway and do some experiments in lab. Uh, so just simply finding out who you would need to talk to, what services you'd have to subscribe to, all of that just makes me uh, and it just means, I know, and we, I think, tend to underappreciate that is the reason that I think, for example, Amazon and Google and Microsoft, to some lesser extent, cloud have succeeded is that they were able, to, that's something that I mean, you can get a free service uh, as a student, you can teach it in a class, people will know it when they graduate as a systems kind of oriented computer science, electrical engineering graduate, so they'll take that into whatever company or startup pet venture or personal venture that they want to do. Who learns about carrier technology in, in their undergraduate program? Very few people do. Uh, and so that just simply because so that bias, I think, will carry over into the professional development until they manage to do that better, including, as I said, we, at the education level, I just don't see that as being successful. Good. We have room for one more question if anyone is eager to ask Henning something. Let's um, just see. 
Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to ask, um, you're talking about cleanly separating access from backbone. So um, the local admin of your LAN or your data center, for example, is able to have more control. And um, I'm just curious as to what do you suppose this might look like? Um, we already have this model of the internet as, okay, you have many autonomous systems that are collaborating, they're sharing their routes using BGP and then they're coming together. So are you essentially saying we should do this entire system at a much more granular level, like um, your micro cells or your local area networks should all negotiate using BGP and come together into a, an internet plus cellular network all in one. Um, is that the model you're- Yeah, not quite. So that's actually, I mean, good. And I don't have a, I mean, this is, a, a, this is where my, the pat answer would be more research is needed on how you would do that. What I would argue is that you should have more clean cut points so that just to take your example or I'm expounding a bit on my example is it should be trivial just like it is when today I can install again a Wi-Fi access point and this can be part of a corporate managed network this can be part of a carrier managed network or it can be part of my home managed network uh, in that and the, the box will likely could even stay the same and I can I use the same physical hardware to do that I should be able to take a CBRS radio for example and I should be able trivially, uh, without really doing anything, I share it between that either by spectrum or just simply on a packet by packet basis so that I can provide a service to, let's say I'm operating a hotel or a, um, a cafe or whatever, or even an enterprise, I should be able to provide guest services to Verizon customers. Um, and I should be able to provide free services to my own guests uh, and my employees uh, in that through the same box without uh, really having to run an extended packet core in my network uh, in that or in the 5G equivalent uh, in that. So I don't think this requires fundamentally new protocols. It requires the ability so that any device really, any cellular device, which largely still, even though I don't think it's technically I mean, impossible to do, largely seems to have a model that there's a carrier internal network uh, that is run between the devices and there's an external network, namely the big woolly internet that the carrier connects to a relatively small number of places. So there are some I mean, handoff models now that are being, started to talk about that are fairly complex to do that, but we still have a lot of tunneling. We still have a lot of these other my, uh, layers that all I, my, make that more difficult than I think is necessary. So I'm advocating for a notion that the physical access layer and my Mac layer and so on uh, should be shareable and easily uh, between both a more large scale enterprise carrier style network and smaller scale local networks without having to run this huge infrastructure in the background so that it truly becomes just a an access component just another wire and an even a switch type equivalent uh, in that and we don't seem to engineer for that i'm not saying it's impossible you can probably make it work i uh, today but it's more difficult than it needs to be Good, very nice discussion, very good answers also from your side, Henning. So by that, I want to thank you, Henning, for delivering an excellent keynote. So please join me in clapping, <laughs> wherever you are. Thank you. thank you, nice seeing some of you. Yeah. Uh, and we, we stay in touch, Henning, so thanks a lot. Well,